let's discuss head autonomics. So all the autonomics that go to the head. So visceral motor innervation is another way of saying the autonomic innervation of the head. And there's two components, parasympathetics, which are cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, and sympathetics, which is the T1 level of the spinal cord. So let's talk about these individually. So let's start with parasympathetics. Remember how parasympathetics is the branch of the autonomic nervous system known as the cranial sacral division cranial because of uh, the origin of the parasympathetics come from the brain stem, cranial region, and sacral because they also come from S234 levels of the spinal cord. So let's take a look at now this cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10. So cranial nerve number 3 is going to be responsible for constricting the pupil and lens accommodation. You don't when someone shines a light in your eye, you don't have to tell your brain to constrict your pupil. It automatically happens. It's a parasympathetic response dealing with cranial nerve 3. Cranial nerve number 7, salivate. So rest and digest. Part of the digest process of the parasympathetic nervous system is the production of saliva to mix with the food. So salivation of submandibular sublingual sublingual salivary glands, lacrimation for the lacrimal glands, and the nasal palatal glands that produce mucus that line your nasal cavity and, the, and your palate as well as your sinuses. That's parasympathetic via cranial nerve 7. Cranial nerve 9, just your parotid gland, making saliva, uh, again rest and digest. And then cranial nerve number 10, all the thoracic and abdominal viscera. So thoracic uh, cavity, slows your heart down, slows cardiac output, and also constricts bronchoconstriction. And then in the abdomen for foregut, midgut, peristalsis of the foregut, midgut, and helps with um, the organs like liver, pancreas, gallbladder, and such. So there we have parasympathetic innervation. Now sympathetics, all sympathetics arise between the T1, L2 level of the spinal cord. Now for the head, it's the T1 level that all sympathetics to the head basically come from. And so to get there, the picture on the right shows the brain stem and cervical cord up above, then there's a division, and then you start with the T1 and you go down level of the spinal cord. Picture on the left shows a lateral view of the head with the sympathetic trunk and ganglion in the cervical region highlighted in red, uh, pardon me, in yellow, and then a branch part of the internal carotid artery is highlighted in red. And so all preganglionic sympathetic neurons come from the T1 level, that lateral horn, and then they course out the ventral root, ventral ramus, in the white ramus, and all the way up to the superior cervical ganglion. And then it synapses, and the postganglionic sympathetics jump on the internal carotid artery like, and wrap around the artery like Christmas lights along a on a tree branch, and then follow the artery all the way up to the head. And then those arteries go through the, become the ophthalmic artery and go into the orbit, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. So the picture uh, on the left, you see that superior cervical ganglion. Now, sympathetics to the head do a lot, but the most clinically relevant place that it acts is in the eye. So in this picture in red, there's the pupillary dilator muscle. When it innervates that muscle, Sympathetics cause your pupil to dilate. That's a sympathetic response, is dilation of the pupil. It also works on the superior tarsal muscle. So this picture shows um, in uh, red, you see the internal carotid artery. In blue, you see sympathetics coming across. And then there's the, in red the pupillary dilator muscle in the pupil. And then up in the, in the upper eyelid, you see this orange muscle. It's called the superior tarsal muscle. And it is smooth muscle that helps to keep your eyelid up. And so sympathetics also help keep your eyelid up. And therefore, if you knock out all the sympathetic innervation to the head, what are the symptoms? Well, our three symptoms are the following. Ptosis, anhydrosis, and meiosis. And I remember this for PAM, PAM has horns for Horner syndrome. In this picture, this patient's right side is the normal side. This patient's left side is the side that has Horner syndrome. So you watch. Ptosis. Look at the 
the those two arrows you see the arrow on the left is bigger which means that eyelid is a little bit droopy so you have this partial ptosis anhydrosis this is a black and white picture so i'm just going to show it using this color the face is flush and when you touch it it is dry no because sympathetics also innervate all the sweat glands of the skin and right down the middle it's like a perfect line Everything on that ipsilateral side, there's no sweating. And then meiosis, you take a look, that, that yellow line that's horizontal is the exact same length on either side. Notice that the pupil in this patient's left side, on the Horner syndrome side, is smaller. So meiosis means a smaller pupil. And there's Horner syndrome, lack of sympathetic innervation to the head.